How many of you have been waiting over 300 days for this day? All right. Some of you haven't been, this is your first time, but um, it's so good to be back, and uh, we're here, it's the first full day, you made it, and uh, I'm looking forward to a great, great week. Well, this week, as I shared last night, we're going to be talking about becoming who you are. And as we think about that, if, if we think about becoming who I am, becoming who we are, that makes me step back and think about this question, who am I? Who are you? And so I want you to be, to be thinking about this morning, who are you really? What gives you your identity? What defines you? You know, we all desire, we all long to have an identity. Every single one of us desire to have an identity. And it's because you and I were created in the image of God. We were fashioned and made in the likeness of our creator. And as such, we have an inner desire. We have an, a, a desire for an identity. And so all of us, all of us wrestle with this issue of identity. And as I shared a little bit last night, when I came here as Savior, but I wasn't embracing that as my identity as I lived out my life. Now certainly on Sunday, I embraced it as my identity, but I didn't exactly embrace the same identity on Monday and Tuesday. And when, are you with me? All right. Now maybe you know somebody like that. Um, but we have this tendency sometimes to fail to grasp who we really are. And so we search for an identity. And because of our rebellion against God, right, and all sin ultimately is what? Rebellion against God. And so ever since Adam and Eve chose to rebel against God, mankind has lived in rebellion towards its creator. And our rebellion has devastating consequences. And one of those consequences is a loss of our true identity. Our rebellion against our Creator, one of its consequences is that we've lost our true identity of who we are. And so we go on a search for identity. And we try to find identity in so many different things. We try to find meaning and purpose and value in physical appearance, right? Our culture, our world today is obsessed about physical appearance. You have to look a certain way in order to have value or worth. And if you don't look a certain way or you're not a certain shape, then you don't have as much value or worth as someone else. Maybe you've encountered that because it's all over our culture. Sometimes we find our value, our identity in our talents. We think my talent, my skills, my ability is what gives me identity. It gives me value. It gives me purpose. Sometimes we look in our achievements, in our successes, our popularity, our place of birth, right? And we think where I'm from is what gives me value. That's not true. Sometimes we find our value or identity in our sports teams, all right? All right we, we, we dress up to represent them, right? We, we find, oh, I'm an Eagles fan, all right? Any, any Eagles fans out there? All right. A few years ago, it was like half the room. We're, we're, we, need to, we need to refocus our recruiting. Um, <laughs> We find identity in our economic status, how much money we have, I'm middle class, I'm upper class, I'm no class. We find our identity in our sexuality, that's sort of a big issue now in culture today. We find our identity in our political preferences, our theological systems, right? Our isms that we're so sure are the most important thing, right? You know, I'm a, you know, and then you add ism on the end. We find our identity in so many different things, but I want you to know this morning is that Jesus offers you something better. Jesus offers you something greater. He offers you a greater identity. He offers you the under opportunity to have a new identity. Here's the thing. He offers you the opportunity to be somebody that you never were. Have you ever wished that you were someone else? Anybody? All right, I think all of us had at some point where we thought, I would really love to be so-and-so because they, they seem to have it all together. They're cool or they're popular or they're talented or they just seem like everything is great for them. I would love to be them. But here's the thing, in and through the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have been given the invitation to be someone that you never were. And we're going to be talking about that this week. You are offered in Christ a new life, a new identity, and understanding and embracing that identity will shape how you see yourself and ultimately how you live out your life. Because here it is, what you believe about yourself, who you believe you are, will impact how 
you live. The identity that we believe we have, the identity that we embrace affects our behavior and it affects our actions. And so I want us to consider that understanding your true identity is vital to experiencing the life that God has designed you for and the destiny that he's called you to. All right, God has designed you. He's given you a destiny. And in order to experience that, you need to embrace who you are. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And, and that might seem basic, but I, I want you to just think about that for a moment. God has a plan for your life. God has a purpose for you. And I believe that it's in understanding who we are that we'll understand and discover that plan and that purpose for our life. God's, God's work of, of grace, God's work of salvation, the gospel message, is an opportunity to know God, to have our rebellion ended, and to have our relationship with Him restored. And in God's great purpose and plan in that, He wants to make you like Himself. Three main parts that we talk about in salvation. We talk about justification. All right, that's when we come to know Christ and we believe on Him in faith and we trust Him as our Savior and we commit our life to Him. The Bible says that God declares us not guilty now in His sight. He says that we have been made righteous before Christ because of God's royal decree, because of the blood that Jesus shed on our behalf. And then we talk about in the end glorification, that time where God's going to take you to be with Himself, where you will be completely perfect, completely whole, and you will live in the presence of God forever and ever and ever. But in between those two aspects of salvation, there's another one that we use a big word called sanctification. But it's the idea that God is making and working out that which he's already worked in us. He's making us to be like himself. And understanding your identity, embracing who you are, will position you for God to do his work of sanctification in your life. You see, the gospel is not just a message about going to heaven. All right, so many times we've boiled it down to that, but it's so much greater. The gospel is an invitation to live in and for the kingdom of God, to know him and to discover his purposes. And if we are going to do that, we need to understand who we are. We need to see ourselves the way God sees us. And so that's my heart and my desire for you this week, is that you would see yourself the way God sees you. Because when you see yourself the way God sees you, it will change the way that you live. So we're going to look at five, what I believe are very key aspects of how we need to see ourselves. And today we're going to start out by looking at one that you've all heard of. It's probably going to be very familiar to you, but I think it's so, so crucial. And that is child. One of the ways that God wants you and I to see ourselves is as his children. Now, that's a sort of a basic thought to some of us, and we think we've all heard this idea of being a child of God. How many of you have heard that phrase? Raise your hand. All right. We've all heard this idea of being a child of God. We call ourselves the children of God. But this morning, I want us to just kind of take a few moments to think about what does that really mean, and what implications does that have for our lives. And I want to begin this morning by looking at 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. So if you have your Bible with you, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. And there John writes these words. He says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. Let's just think about that for a moment. He says, See, or your translation may say, Behold what kind of love, what manner of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God. You see, being called a child of God, it, it's so common, it's so familiar that sometimes I think we miss the weight of its importance. We miss the value that God places on us when we just move quickly over this. He says, consider, see, really understand what kind of love, the depth of the love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. You see, through the gospel... Right Through this message right, that Jesus was the Son of God and God the Son. That when Jesus came into this world, he didn't come into this world the way you and I did. Are you with me? All right, all of you had a mom and a dad that were part of the process of bringing you into this world. But Jesus came to this world supernaturally. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He was born supernaturally because he wasn't just a man. He was the God-man. God come in human flesh. The second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son, entered our world. He entered our existence. 
And the Bible says his purpose and his reason to, for coming, for entering our world, was that he might restore the relationship with him that we had forfeited through sin. He came to die the death that you deserve to die. The wages of sin is what? Death. How many of you are sinners? All right. Wow. <laughs> we have accumulated a room full of sinners. All right. Every single one of us are sinners. Every single one of us have broken God's law. We've all rebelled against him. None of us have kept God's law. The prophet Isaiah said that we've all gone our own way. We are all guilty. But Jesus came and he chose to go to the cross and to bear the weight of your guilt, to pay for the penalty of your sin, to die in your place and in my place, to bear the Father's wrath for your sin. And so Jesus came and he died for you, but before he died for you, he lived for you. Right? He lived a perfect life. He never sinned. He lived the life that none of us could live. He died the death that all of us deserve to die, and he rose from the dead. And that's what makes Jesus and the message of the gospel distinct from every other religion, from every other philosophy, from every other spiritual belief. And there are thousands of spiritual beliefs, hundreds of religions. But Jesus says, I am the exclusive way to the Father. I am the way to God. There is no other. And he demonstrated that through his supernatural origins, through his life, through his teaching, through his miracles, he demonstrated that he was God. But ultimately, it was his prediction that I, he would die and rise from the dead that distinguishes Jesus from every other philosophy and from every other religion. He came and who died for you and who rose again. And he invites you and I through the gospel to experience forgiveness, to experience life. He comes and lives in us and we live in him and that gives us a new identity. It makes us somebody that we never were. And that is the amazing invitation of the gospel. We get a brand new life, a brand new identity. We become someone that we never were. And God wants you to see yourself the way he sees you. He wants you to see yourself as his child. And embrace that label. Now, it's one thing to call yourself something. It's one thing to see yourself as something but if you're not that thing, it really doesn't matter. Let, let me illustrate. I could tell you this morning that uh, this uh, preaching thing that I do, is it's just sort of my side job. Mostly, I'm an NFL quarterback. <laughs> right? I could tell you that I'm an NFL quarterback. I could, it was sort of always my secret dream. Um, very secret. Um, I could tell you that I'm an NFL quarterback. I could believe that I'm an NFL quarterback, right? But that would not what? It would not make me an NFL quarterback, right? You can say anything about yourself that you want. You can take on any label. You can call yourself anything. But if you're not that thing, it doesn't matter. And I want you to realize that in seeing yourself as a child of God, as calling yourself a child of God, labeling yourself as a child of God, you're not just doing that as some sort of psychological exercise. You're doing that because that's who you are. Look back at 1 John 3. He says, Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And what does he say? And so we are. It's who you are. It's not just a label. It's your identity. It's how God chooses to see you now through Christ. And I want you to see yourself the same way that God sees you. You are God's child. He wanted you. He adopted you into his family. He calls you sons and daughters. Look at 2 Corinthians 6 18. He says, I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now let's just step back for a minute and think about that. The God of the universe, right, who, who created all that we see and we know and, and, and through technology we can see really, really far today. We can see light years out into our universe and we've never found the end of it. And yet the Bible says that God measures all of that with the span of his hand. And so this great God who created the universe, who sustains the universe by his power, says, I would like you to know me as Father." And I will call you son and daughter. Is that not an amazing thought? That God chooses to see us that way? And that he made us to become his children? He had chose us. He wanted you. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. It says, In love 
He predestined us. He chose us for adoption, right? I mean, it wasn't just that he happened to have you, right? I have two children, right? They came along. We, we didn't get an option to whether we kept them or not, right? They, they, we had them. We were at the hospital, and they said, now you take this home. <laughs> Is there a manual? Instruction? No, just take it home, all right? But God says he adopted us. That means it was an intentional choice. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to what? The purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. If you're in Christ, if you know him as Savior, you are God's child. He wanted you. He chose you. He adopted you. That's who you are and that's how he wants you to see yourself. So I just want you to, to turn to the person next to you for a minute and just tell them, I am God's child. All right. I don't want you to just say it. I want you to believe it. What does it mean? What does it mean to be God's child? Well, it means a lot of things, and, and unfortunately, this is not like a church service. I don't get to preach as long as I want to. But, <laughs> uh, just when you think the people that love you the most. Um, so, just three things that I want to share with you this morning about what it means to be God's child. Number one, it, it means that God loves you no matter what. Because you are God's child, if you are in Christ, if you know Jesus as your Savior, if you've come to a place personally for yourself where you've recognized that Jesus is who he claimed to be, that he was indeed the Messiah, right, the Deliverer, the Rescuer, and if you believe his message that he didn't just come for the house of Israel, but he came for the entire world, that he, the entire world might be reconciled and redeemed and brought into his family. And if you've come to that place where you've believed on Jesus as your Savior and you've given your life to him, then you can know for sure that this promise is for you. God loves you you no matter what. Listen, it's not about how well you're doing. If you didn't read your Bible this last week, this last month, this last year, does God still love me? Yes. Right? His love for you is not based on your performance. It's not based on your goodness. It's based on his willingness and his choice to love you. And so you can know he loves you. Why does he love you? Because you're his. You're his kids. I want to show you a couple kids that I love this morning. That's my daughter, Lena Joy. And uh, my family's here, my wife, Laura, and my children are here, so you get to see them and meet them. Many of you know them. But this is my Lena Joy. Um, she's five. She'll turn six next month. Uh, she is an absolute mess. Uh, but I love her deeply, and uh, we, we like to go out on coffee dates and things like that. I drink the coffee. She eats the muffins. <laughs> um, another picture of her. Man, I love my kids. This is my little boy, Evan Daniel. And uh, you can see I'm, I'm raising him well. And uh, a lifetime of disappointment awaits him. <laughs> I can say that because it's my life story. So. But you know what? It's always better to get more people to join you in your misery. And this is another picture of him. And... Uh, He's a lot of fun. He's my little buddy. But yep, these are my kids. And I love them desperately. And you know why I love them? I don't love them because they can do anything for me. I don't love them for any other reason than they're mine. They're mine. And Laura's. <laughs> and she did all the work. But... I love them because they're mine. I take delight in them. I take pleasure in them. I, I peeked in on them this morning while they were still sleeping and I just enjoyed looking at them and how they were. And then Evan woke up and he was sort of out of it still and I just scooped him up and I was like, I know what you want. You want to, you want to curl up by mommy because now I've vacated that spot. <laughs> so I took him over there and put him back in bed. I love my kids just because they're mine. And I want you to know that God feels the same way about you, except his love is far more perfect than my love is for my kids. His love is far deeper than my love for my kids. He loves you just because you're his. And he takes delight in you. He takes pleasure in you. He loves showing your picture off. Have you seen my kids? Man, I love them. God loves you. It's such a basic statement, but it's a truth I think we often fail to really internalize. God loves you no matter what. You don't have to earn his love. 
You can't earn his love. My kids cannot earn my love. There's nothing they could do to earn it. They already have it. And that's how God feels about you. Number two, God will be with you in every circumstance. There's never ever a moment that God will ever abandon one of his children. And so if you're God's child, if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you can know God will never, ever, ever abandon me. Now listen, there's going to be days, there's going to be moments in your life where you feel like God is very distant. There's going to be circumstances in your life. Maybe you're there right now. Maybe you came to camp and that's how you feel. I believe in God and I know him as my Savior, but it just seems like he's not there right now. I don't feel close to him. I don't sense his presence. I'm, I'm not sure where he's at. There will be times that you feel like that, but here's what you need to know. If you are God's child, he has not abandoned you. He is with you. He will never abandon you. There, there are times that, that I'm out with my kids and, and they'll say something like, Daddy, Daddy, wait for me. Don't leave me. Right? And, and I have to stop and say, has Daddy ever left you? No. Right? But there's that fear. Don't leave me. Don't abandon me. Here's the thing. Your father will never abandon you. He'll never, ever abandon you. You're his child. And although he may allow you to go through difficulty, he may allow you to go through hardship, he may allow you to go through hard circumstances, he has not abandoned you, he has not forgotten you. He is with you. And he sees, he knows, and he cares. Jesus was described as a man of sorrows. The Bible says he was acquainted with the bitterest of grief. Jesus knows deeply what it means to hurt. And he does not always remove our suffering. He does not always remove our problems or our pain. In fact, sometimes he ordains them in his purposes for our good. But he never, ever abandons us in those moments. He walks through those moments with us. He never leaves or forsakes his children. He never will. He cannot. And you can trust that this morning. Family, just a husband and wife and a daughter. And the mom passed away. The little girl and dad were really, really struggling. As they walked through this grief together one night, uh, the little girl came into her daddy's room and she said, Daddy, can I sleep with you? Because it's really, really, really dark. And I'm scared. And he said, of course. And she climbed in bed with him. And after a minute or two, she said, Daddy, it's still really dark. And he said, I know, honey. It's darker than it's ever been. And it's dark for me, too. And then a few minutes later, she reached over and he felt her touching his face. And he said, What's, what is it, honey? And she said, I just needed to know that your face was towards me. And she said, now I can sleep. And I want you to know this morning that your father in heaven, his face is towards you. Listen, he sees and he knows and he cares. Never ever doubt the love of your father. And if by chance that you may, and I have in my walk, remember this, he willingly gave up his son for you. When you're tempted to doubt God's love, just remember the cross. Remember that God chose in his great love for you to adopt you into his family at the price, at the cost. Every adoption is expensive. Every adoption has a price and the price of your adoption was the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross for you. And so when you doubt God's love, just remember he loved me enough to die for me. He loved me enough to give up his son for me. I can trust him. Jesus gave us this promise in Luke chapter 12, verse 32. He said, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Right? Your Father has given you an inheritance. He loves you. He'll be with you in every circumstance. And number three, He expects you to trust Him and obey Him. Just like we sang about last night at sing time. Right? God is your Father, expects you to trust Him and obey Him. And that's part of the child-parent relationship. And God, as your Father, wants you to learn to trust Him and obey Him. Why? Because He loves you. He has your best interests at heart. He has good things for you. And He cares about you. And so He calls you to live under His authority. Not because you have to, but because you can. 
Not because you you have to obey this set of rules and regulations to earn his love. He already loves you. He's lavished his love on you. He's adopted you. He's called you. And he wants you to trust him. He wants you to believe that if you trusted him to save you, that his way of living is best and good. You know, there's nothing better as a parent than when your kids trust you and obey you. It feels good. Right? And and I don't don't know how other parents are, but I, I root for my kids. All right? It's like, come on, just, just do the right thing. I, I really don't want to punish you. Like, I, I really, and you just you root for them to make the right decision, and sometimes they do, and a lot of times they don't. But I want you to know you're a father in heaven. He's rooting for you. Right? He's, he's desiring that you would follow him and trust him and obey him because you're his child. And that's the proper avenue of experiencing your relationship with him is to trust him and to obey him, to live under his authority. And here's the thing. If you're his child and you don't live under his authority, he will discipline you. Right? Why? As proof of his love for you. As proof of his love. He will discipline you, not because he's angry, but because he loves you and he wants you to to be walking with him and close to him. God desires that you would become who you are. And it begins by embracing your identity. And this morning, it begins by embracing, embracing your identity as God's child. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. You are God's child. If you are in Christ, you are God's child. That's who you are. That's your identity. And so I want to challenge you this morning to see yourself that way, to to agree with God. I'm God's child. And to see yourself, to view yourself that way. When you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror, just say, there's one of God's children. That's one of God's kids. I am God's child. And your value and your worth come from what God places on you and nothing else. Your value and your worth don't come from your looks, your talent, your abilities, the approval of others, what other people say about you, how other people evaluate you, how many friends you have, how many likes you get on your posts, right? That's not where your value comes from. Your value and your worth come from your Father in heaven and He's declared that you're His child, that you're His masterpiece. He values you. He loves you. He cares about you. Never forget, God loves you. Don't forget that. God's with you, and God expects you to trust Him and obey Him, to live under His authority. My heart, my prayer this morning for each of you is that you would see yourself as you really are, and that when you embrace your position as God's child, it will change the way that you live. Would you bow your heads this morning as we just take a moment to prayerfully reflect on God's Word. First of all, this morning, maybe you've you've come to camp and and you're hearing this message about the Gospel, but you'd be really honest with yourself and you'd say, I've heard about God, I've heard this Gospel message, but I never for myself have believed. I never for myself have come to a place where I have surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, received His forgiveness and become His child. And if, if that's you today, I want you to know the greatest invitation that's ever been given has been extended to you. That Jesus Christ was and is the Son of God. He came to this earth. He died on the cross for you and for your sin. He rose from the dead. And if you will believe on Him as your Savior, if you will confess Him as your Lord, and He will redeem you. He will rescue you. He will forgive your sin. He will come to live in you. He will adopt you as His child. And you can experience that today by faith from your heart. Just tell Him that, that you want to be His child that you want his forgiveness and his grace and his mercy and you want to live your life as his child. And for all of you this morning, I want you to embrace that place in your identity. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what's happened in the past year for those of you that I know and for those of you I don't yet know. I don't know all the things that might be going on, but I know this. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, God loves you deeply. And you don't have to earn that love. He loves you because you're His. He'll never abandon you. And He calls you to trust Him and obey Him. Father, I pray for each and every one of us. Father, I know that we all have a tendency sometimes to forget who we are. Father, I know that as I came here as a camper, I didn't really understand who I was. 
And because of that, I wasn't living out the life that you had called me to live. And Father, I thank you that, that here, 20 years ago, you began to redirect my steps and to bring me into an understanding of who you are and who I was. And Father, I pray that, that you would do for everyone here this morning what you did for me. And Father, that you would bring them into a deeper awareness of who you are. That they would experience your love and your grace in a deeper and richer way than they ever have before. And Father, I pray that all of us would see ourselves as your children. And Father, I pray that it would change, transform the way that we live. That our embracing our identity as your child would affect our decisions. It would affect the way that we act, the way that we treat people, the way that we look at life. Father, so that we might experience all that you have for us, the purpose and the plans that you've laid out for our lives. Father, we love you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.